I'm going to officially welcome you to our Stay Cool for Grandkids webinar called Careers for Changing Climate. And I'm going to share my screen just to make sure you're in the right place. I'm very excited about this. We have three exceptional speakers. Our first speaker will be, um, hang on one second here. Let me just move to the next. Our first speaker will be Natalie Laverly, uh, who is a digi digital marketing and content curator for Climate People. Our second speaker will be Dr. Corey Gabriel, who's the executive director of the Scripps Institution, Institution of Oceanography, Climate Science and Policy. Uh, and then Jason Anderson, who I've known for many, many years, who is the president and CEO of CleanTech will be our wrap up speaker. And before we get started, I just wanna make sure you know a little bit about Stay Cool and why we choose to do all of these educational outreach efforts to our Stay Cool members. We are motivated because 20 years from now, our children and grandchildren will be living in a different world, not on a different world, but in a different world. And we are concerned about that. And while we know we can't stop the changing climate at this point, we want to slow down and mitigate whatever we can. And we want to figure out how to adapt. And some of that adaptation has to do with these changing careers that we're going to learn about. Um, Stay Cool has three uh, primary uh, uh, components. The first is our very popular middle school ocean climate science program that's reached over 3,000 students in sixth grade. And we're very proud of that. That's our flagship program. We work with graduate students at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and they are fabulous. It's a multi-generational thing. We have stay cool old people with the, with the grad students who are the middle generation working with the sixth graders. So that's one of our favorite things to do. We also want to create informed advocates. And so we have in-person events. Those slowed down a lot because of the pandemic, but they're going to start ramping up soon. We have webinars and we have our our newsletters, and I hope that all of you are um, getting our newsletter, and I hope that you enjoy it because we put a lot of time into it, and I think there's some great information on what's going on here in San Diego. Um, and then, of course, we do a lot of collaboration. We love to collaborate with San Diego Audubon Society in support of their Rewild projects, and for the record, they're our fiscal sponsor. We work with the San Diego Building Electrification Coalition to advance energy efficiency and reduce the use of natural gas. We've worked in the past with the American Planning Association to evaluate wildfire risks as an outcome of climate change and land development decisions. And we also like to support SD350.org, especially their youth program. And with no further ado, we're going to go back to our agenda. I'm gonna stop sharing and I am now going to do a brief introduction of Natalie. Um, Natalie is an avid environmentalist, marketer, communicator, and writing with a passion for digital storytelling. She heads up marketing for Climate People, a climate tech recruitment agency. With a background in grassroots environmental advocacy, she has seen firsthand the dire need for a swift and just transition away from fossil fuel dominated economy. And in her current role at Climate People, she advocates for job seekers and helps encourage people from many fields to transition their careers to climate solutions in hopes of creating a brighter future for all. Climate People is a climate recruitment agency that links com companies with potential employees. And with that, Natalie, it's all yours. Awesome. Let me share my screen really quick. Perfect. Y'all can see that, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Linda. And I'm so excited to be here. 
I'm going to talk today about the future of climate jobs and kind of the role we can all play in that. So as Linda touched on, my name is Natalie Lavery, and I am the marketing lead at Climate People. As Linda said, I have a background in environmental advocacy, and I quickly learned from my few years in that space that boots on the ground campaigning was not for me. So I took a job in a traditional tech space and always kind of felt that disconnect between my passion for the outdoors and the environment and then what I was doing in my nine to five. I didn't know that climate jobs were a thing at that point in my career. Um, so I just kind of ran with that feeling of disconnect until I connected with Climate People's founder, Brendan, on LinkedIn and learned more about climate people and careers in climate. So again, as Linda touched on, Climate People is a recruiting, recruiting firm that's dedicated to decarbonizing the economy through placing mission-driven talent into climate tech careers. So again, we work with both job seekers and then companies who are looking to hire that are working on a climate solution and hopefully pair them too, because as I will get into in a little bit, there is a massive demand in this space. So we are here to help act on that demand a little bit more and mobilize that workforce transition to climate. So according to Terra.do, which is a climate education platform, we need 100 million people working in climate by 2030 to address the demands of the climate crisis. Let that sink in a little bit. We currently have 5 million people. And in seven years, we need 100 million. So that means that 99% of the people who will be working in this space in the next decade have not started yet. So hopefully that paints the demand a little bit because there's a significant demand. So before we dive into that demand a little bit more, I do wanna backtrack a little bit and go back to the basics of what even is climate tech. Um, it's a new industry, so there are countless definitions that are out there, but at Climate People, we break it up into three specifications. So we have greenhouse gas mitigation, climate adaptation, and carbon sequestration. Greenhouse gas mitigation is any technology that is removing or lowering the amount of carbon in the air. We have climate adaptation, which is essentially the effects of climate change are already affecting us and how can we adapt to those and be resilient in the face of them. And then we have carbon sequestration, which is removing carbon from the air. And essentially climate tech is any technological service that is working to eliminate, remove, or reduce the harms of these carbon emissions. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the basics of climate tech, but I encourage you to think of climate tech not as an industry, but as a reimagining of the entire global economy. So I like to say that every job can be a climate job because to get to that 100 million that I just touched on, we're gonna need to re-envision every job and view it through a climate lens. So think of all the sectors like industry, transportation, food, buildings, energy, and so on and so forth. And think of all of the jobs that are already in those sectors and try to imagine how they can be reformed with a climate lens. So for example, I'm in marketing, but I work for a climate company. So my job's a climate job, but then also a climate job could be people who are working on wind turbines or solar panels or more of the traditional things as well. Um, so that's kind of a little synopsis on climate jobs. But to go back to that 100 million that I touched on, this is a curve of early adoption. Right now, the climate community and the climate space is in its early adopter space. So that means that the people who are currently working in this space are innately passionate about climate and tend to go out of their way to seek these resources and these jobs. However, climate people, we like to classify our job seekers into four different personas. So we have those that are climate motivated. These people 100% want to work in climate and know exactly how. We have those that are climate focused. They want to work in climate, but don't really care which sector or anything like that. We have those that are driven by impact. That means that they want to log out at the end of the day and feel satisfied and like they're doing something meaningful, but that doesn't have to be climate. And then lastly, we have those who are not optimizing their search for mission. So if we think back to that curve I just showed you, currently we have persona one and persona two in climate. But to get to that 100 million that I've reiterated so many times, we need to find ways to attract and engage all four of these personas, even the people who aren't necessarily caring about climate at all. 
Um, so some context to all of this, the majority of job seekers that are out there fall into that persona three. So they want to work on something meaningful, but it doesn't have to be climate. Similarly, climate companies that I work with a lot are prioritizing candidates who care about climate and make climate their number one priority. So <laughs> we need millions of people who are working in climate companies are limiting themselves because they're requiring people to have climate experience. And then the same side of that same coin, job seekers are also limiting themselves because they're not optimizing their search for climate and they're not really selling that. So in response to all of this, um, the climate people team conducted a survey that really aimed to pinpoint exactly what was preventing people from getting a job in this space, because obviously to do anything about it, we have to know what these issues even are. So we interviewed around 600 individuals and asked them what was preventing them from getting a job in this space. And these are the three takeaways that we compile for job seekers based off of that survey. The first is to not disqualify yourself. So as I touched on already, companies in this space are preferring people with climate experience. However, statistically, that is impossible because we need 100 million people and not that many people have climate experience, or at least they don't now. So don't let that be your deciding factor as to whether or not there's going to be a job in this space. Definitely still do all the things you would do and put yourself out there. Second, know the ins and the outs. Again, climate companies are prioritizing people who align with this mission. So it's a job seeker's responsibility to show the company and the hiring manager that they do in fact align with the mission. So learn as much about the industry as possible. Attend events like this, join climate communities, resource, read books, um, all of that. I can link to some of my favorite resources um, that we can send out after, but definitely immerse yourself. And then third, and most importantly, is don't be your own worst critic. The responses from our survey, survey showed that people have a disconnect between how they view their own place in the industry and how they view others. This is just because it's a, a new field and quite frankly, they're letting imposter syndrome kind of take over their search. So understand that it's a new industry and that other people have not already paved the path quite yet, but see the role you can you play with that without dis, um, disqualifying yourself. So one final reminder that climate is not your traditional job search. It sounds a little cliche, but everyone that's working in this space knows that the more people we have in climate, the quite literally the brighter all of our futures will be. So I encourage everyone who's interested in a career in this space to network and to get to know people because it is a very, very open space. I know when I was looking for traditional tech jobs, it could be a little dis disheartening and people would ignore you. However, people in this space are very open. I try to respond to every job seeker inquiry that I get just because I know how important it is to get people working in this space. So definitely don't get discouraged is my final takeaway. So yeah, thank you so much for attending this today and wanting to learn more. You can find me at all of these places and I'd be happy, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. That was awesome, Natalie. Thank you so much. I love that. So just to tell everyone again, because I think I said earlier, but I might not have, that if you're interested in following up with Q&A, please type your questions in the chat and we will read those questions at the end after everyone has, um, has done their uh, presentation. But Natalie, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. All right, our second presenter is um, Corey, Dr. Corey Gabriel. And he is the executive director, as I said, of the Masters of Advanced Studies, Climate Science and Policy program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. So Dr. Uh, Corey Gabriel graduated from the College of William and Mary and the University of North Carolina. Um, he got a law degree at, at Chapel Hill and then he passed the bar, but Corey doesn't just sit. He's not satisfied with that. He returned after a couple of years to graduate school getting an MS and then a PhD in atmospheric science at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And his ongoing research focuses on climate change and climate modeling with a particular interest 
in using global climate models to conduct simulations sorry, of various climate engineering techniques. Corey has been the executive director of the CSP program and a lecturer at Scripps UCSD since August of 2017. And it's my great pleasure now to turn this over to Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I, um, like Linda mentioned, I, um, my training is as a climate model or came climate model and I came as a surprise to a lot of scientists that I, um, sorry, I'm having a little issue with my bandwidth. So I'm not gonna be able to, um, you're not gonna be able to see my face for right now. Um, I, um, I expected to enter a career where I would be helping develop climate models and helping design simulations about climate scenarios and um, helping hopefully frame the discussion about a climate engineering technique, uh, geoengineering, where um, in climate models, fortunately not in reality yet, uh, sulfate aerosols and other aerosols could be released into the stratosphere to potentially cool the planet by potentially a half a degree or so. This is the mechanism is something we learned from volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991 and uh, some other eruptions, including El Chichon um, and you know, seeing a cooling effect after those eruptions. So the idea is if mitigation and adaptation are not sufficient to quell the climate problem and you know, mitigation is underway, but there's still an overshoot where the temperature is, say, two and a half, three degrees above pre-industrial and, say, the year 2050. Do we deal with the impact, right, temperature-dependent impacts of three degrees of warming, or do we develop the technology and governance where we attempt to block the sun a little bit and cool the planet? So that's an ongoing area of research, and obviously it comes with a lot of moral hazard and a lot of caveats and um, it's not something that's being done in the field um, at this time but um, I moved away from that not because I didn't find it interesting but I got a really great opportunity to be the director of a um, climate science and policy program at a really amazing place Scripps Institution of Oceanography a place it's been at the you know at the forefront of many many important things from from climate change to really um, America's efforts in World War II and the post-war development of a Navy, techn naval technology, et cetera, and now being such a leader in the climate problem. And Scripps had the vision to arrange a program where students who were had some aptitude and skill and experience either on the science side of the physical science side of things from um, or a chemistry or biology perspective or a career that involved policy or political science, we're look, looking to explicitly work in a climate career. And in order to do that, UC developed a series of professional master's programs. And the one that I am um, the director for, what we do is we, we offer really talented people from a wide variety of careers. We've had journalists, teachers, engineers, lawyers, et cetera, in the program and help them learn about the physical science basis of global warming and therefore the physics of the earth and ocean system, but then also from the policy side, learn not that there's really first principles of political science, but learn to think about uh, Learn to think about the global warming problem and the content and the way policymakers or the people who advise policymakers are going to think with, you know, actors acting rationally and what their interests are and what the barriers to effective action might be, whether it's distributed conflict or collective action, et cetera. And then in the program to integrate the, the, all of that policy and political science thinking with the um, knowledge about the earth system and produce a capstone that's kind of right at the intersection of um, climate science and policy and then move into a career that's sort of at that intersection and um, what i've decided to do is just to highlight 
several of our graduates. And honestly, it wasn't that difficult to find um, eight that were excellent. I um, I could have probably picked uh, eight others and told, so I'll, so I'll just tell the story of climate careers through them. So I'll scroll down if I, Linda, I'm, I think um, I, I'm, I'd be the one to scroll down here, right? Not you. Yeah, you do it. There okay, you go. sweet. Yeah. So um, here are some recent graduates of our program. On the bottom, far bottom right, we actually have the Scripps graduation speaker from uh, 2021, which is a pretty big deal. The 2022 speaker was an astronaut. So Audrey hasn't been to outer space yet, but if there's anybody I know who might be the first journalist to go to outer space, I really wouldn't bet against Audrey, honestly. Um, and if the casinos are smart, the odds won't be that um, will be pretty good in her favor. So she might do it one day. But she um, was a reporter with the Straight Times, uh, the largest newspaper in Southeast Asia, new newspaper record for Singapore, and wanted to dig in on the climate issue. So she came to this program, the newspaper paid for it. Um, she has a background in science with a degree from the National University of Singapore in uh, biology. And she came to the program, wanted to basically become a better reporter. And um, what this did for her is it, it, it definitely got her a promotion and more interesting work. She won a lot of really meaningful and important awards covering environmental issues, but also immediately after she graduated, or not immediately, but time blurs, but maybe within about a year, within a year, nine months after she graduated, COVID occurred. So a reporter with a recent background in science and communicating about science and learning about a novel um, topic was really important. And that led to her winning a lot of awards. She's since pivoted out to work on um, a communicate, being a communications lead on a very important initiative for the National University of Singapore, where they're um, promoting nature-based solutions, which is a really big lever for that part of the world, right? It might not be a great, great solution everywhere, but in that part of the world in the future with carbon markets, et cetera, emerging major focus of Southeast Asia. And she's in a very, very important and senior role helping lead that initiative. Um, right next to Audrey, we see uh, we see Gregor. Gregor is uh, a master's, already had a master's degree in engineering when he came here from uh, Germany and graduated in 2021. I worked with, like a, Audrey also adv advised her on her capstone, which is about uh, El Nino and La Nina and the Galapagos in Indonesia. And she actually went to both places during the capstone, which was pretty cool. But um, with Gregor, we did a, a project on wind modeling in Southern California. He's now working with Orsted, helping develop wind projects in the North Sea um, and living in Denmark. Um, Rhea, um, amazing ability to explain meteorology and i um and i gotta say my uh driving passion is the science of the atmosphere and she uh she really just just gets the i got has got gets got the atmosphere like another student and she um is now um doing uh life cycle analysis work at um clean agency so quantitative skills and um Kind of skills she learned in her capstone where she made a documentary kind of coming together quickly now bethany um brown graduate water polo player um career in communications uh was actually an english major but pivoted and did a heavy quantitative capstone on energy grid modeling and is now working as an energy scientist doing actual science work related to energy modeling so a really impressive career pivot she completed there um I don't want to go through everybody because we're probably short on time. But lastly, uh, last year I advised um, a project by Claire Le Claire Levesque there, and uh, Claire's background is interesting. She was a intern for the House, um, I think, Science Technology Committee. She had been a neuroscience researcher at Saint Jude. Her undergraduate degrees in neuroscience, so definitely think systems thinking there. And she identified, you know, we were, we're, we're building out intermittents, but storage is hard and storage is expensive and it's not going to be perfect. We're going to need base load. And there's going to be things like making steel, which, by the way, is about 7% of our um, emissions, I, I believe. Um, 
uh, are going to be very hard to mitigate, right? Because you need very high temperatures. But hydrogen, even though you have you know thermodynamic loss, etc., is a is actually a viable. If the pause can come down, actually a viable technology potentially for making um, things like that and steel, particularly and possibly concrete, but steel particularly. And um, so we did a project trying to think about how to. Uh, how to actually make green hydrogen in a way that could be used to make things like steel. Really successful project. And Claire's now working at the California Energy Commission. One of her principal um, jobs there is actually working on um, uh, California's um, endeavors to um, emerge uh, in, with a new hydrogen economy. So the adoption of some uh, some hydrogen, both from federal and state funding, so I would say the common thread would be stuff that matters, right? Uh, microgrids, resiliency, hydrogen, hard to mitigate sector, wind power in Europe, necessary, right? Could even be base load if the wind is used to make hydrogen, which they're thinking about doing. And Audrey um, has really distinguished herself as a graduate too. So really proud to have all these people. And the common thread is careers where they make a real impact because people see the urgency of the issue and that the, in their entire lives going forward are gonna be spent living in a context where climate change is one very important driver of, of everything. So um, thanks for the opportunity and uh, look forward to the next speaker and uh, any questions you might have. Thank you. Corey, thank you so much. That was so nice to see um, what those students are doing now. That's a great way to do that um, presentation for your part of it. Very exciting. So um, if you close your, uh, your slides now, we'll move on to um, Jason. Yeah, that's awesome though, Corey. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, I want to do my introduction for Jason. Uh, Jason Anderson is president and CEO of Clean Tech San Diego. It's a business organization that positions the greater San Diego region as a global leader in the clean tech economy. And um, before joining Clean Tech San Diego in 2010, wow, you have been there a long time. Jason was vice president of business development for the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation, EDC. He serves on the boards of the San Diego Urban Sustainability Coalition, Connect, uh, the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation, the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative, and uh, Equality California, the nation's largest um, gay, bisexual, and transgender civil rights organization. In 2021, Jason was named by the San Diego Business Journal as one of San Diego's LGBTQ plus leaders of influence. And Jason holds a degree in corporate communications from the University of Texas in Austin. Jason, please share your screen. I feel like I'm a game show guy. You, you, you are. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate the Texan accent. If I unblurred my screen on my wall there behind me is a big set of longhorns. Um, <laughs> Linda, thanks for having me and thanks for putting this together. I, when you were saying you've known me for a long time, I think it's been like 16 years or something crazy like that. Uh, not to age either one of us. Yeah, um, yeah about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's been two years. I've only known you for two years. Um, but I think I spoke actually to a, a, a stakeholder for grandkids event up in Solana Beach, uh, gosh, probably six or so years ago if the organization was around them. But uh, definitely familiar of all the great work uh, that the organization's doing and, and getting out the message to not only your members, but um, their kids and grandkids as well. Uh, so I'm going to take a little bit different approach, I think, the, this evening and kind of in terms of what I'm going to present here and really just talk about what's happening here in San Diego uh, from an industry perspective. And I think hopefully that'll uh, give some people here just an idea of the types of technologies and the types of um, projects that are happening here in our region, because I really see those as really driving uh, the employment sector here 
uh, that the previous speakers talked about. So as Linda said in my, uh, the background, uh, I've been with Clean Tech San Diego for, for probably too long, uh, at least a long time. Uh, but we are a business association that was founded now 16 years ago uh, to really help position San Diego as a leader in this space. And the organization was actually founded when the state of California uh, was passing AB 32, which is the global climate change uh, legislation that was passed. Um, and we, at the time, uh, the the uh, the mayor of San Diego, uh, the the some of the business leaders in the region, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, sdg &E, UCSD, and others, came together and said, you know, the state of California is really getting aggressive with renewable energy goals, and and that's going to be a really great thing, and it's going to be a really great thing for not only the environment but also the economy. And San Diego is pretty well positioned to kind of hold its own. Um, in the technology space. And so this organization was really founded uh, to help support technology and company growth um, in the region. Um, as, as we kind of define what this clean tech is or, or climate tech, as the previous speaker said, we really think about things that are energy related. So solar, wind, energy efficiency, uh, battery storage, electric vehicles, and, and uh, kind of renewable fuels. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and really, you know, just kind of pointing out kind of at the bottom of the screen there, just really founded um, on the premise that as we set a high bar for sustainability around this state, um, industry would respond, technologies would be created, and and, tech, and companies would be formed, and therefore um, this industry would not only have an impact on our environment, but, but on our economy. Um, Again, you know, our mission, pretty simple, uh, just to accelerate the growth uh, and innovation in, in San Diego, uh, not again, for the benefit of the economy, the benefit of the environment, and, and for all members of our community. Um, so what do we do? We position San Diego as a global leader. Uh, we speak outside of San Diego quite often about what's happening here in San Diego. Uh, we work in the academic, with private, public and academic partners. Um, we are engaged in advocacy efforts to promote the priorities that are of importance to our businesses and the technologies that we support. Uh, about six years ago, and I'll talk a little bit about this in more detail, uh, we launched a program with funding from the California Energy Commission, uh, the Southern California Energy Innovation Network. And in that program, uh, we support early stage energy entrepreneurs. Uh, and we work with uh, all three of our academic institutions here, our higher ed academic institutions here, and a number of different partners around the region uh, to really support uh, entrepreneur uh, activity in San Diego in the energy space. So our members include uh, 130 businesses now. Uh, we work with the universities, government, nonprofits, and um, others in the space, uh, really working towards that common goal of advancing our, our clean technology solutions here in our region. When we think about this industry, uh, we think obviously about the environmental impact, uh, but as a business organization, uh, we obviously think about the economic impact. And so these numbers on your screen uh, right now are uh, the most recent economic impact of the clean tech sector here in San Diego County. Um, I, I hope you'll take away from this that it is not insignificant, um, $8.8 billion in economic impact on our regional economy. Um, to put it in perspective, the biotech industry here, which uh, you all know is is quite significant, has about a two hundred and forty eight billion dollar impact on our economy. Uh, so we're just a fraction of that. Uh, but I like to think we're holding our own, uh, especially related to kind of the biotech industry here. But but about uh, eleven thousand, almost thirty thousand. Uh, uh, if you look at the numbers, there about twenty thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars direct, or twenty thousand jobs, direct jobs in this space. And then indirect and induced gets us up to around 40,000, uh, almost a thousand uh, businesses. Uh, that number continues to grow. And the average earnings in this industry uh, are not insignificant, especially here in San Diego. So we've been doing this report uh, with the regional EDC for the last, I think, 10 or so years. Um, and these numbers over those 10 years um, climb significantly every year. And a lot of that's in part to what's happening from a policy perspective. And I think when we come back and do this report in the next couple of years, when we really see the impact of what's happening at the federal level um, on this sector here in our region, uh, I hope and I'm pretty certain that those numbers will continue to grow. But, but we're at really an unprecedented time from the federal government in terms of $470 billion being uh, put into uh, climate change uh, you know, over the next 10 years. And, and we hope 
Uh, and I can assume that we'll start getting some of those funds um, down here in San Diego, especially as we look at electrification of buses, school uh, EV infrastructure, um, supporting technology in early stage companies. Uh, you know, California obviously is the fourth largest economy in the world. Is uh, will we'll receive a significant amount of this money, but I hope that money finds its way down here to San Diego, and we're definitely um, in conversations that that will happen. Um, you know. Uh, I think at the state level, we know California has always been a leader as we think about climate and as we think about renewable energy. These are just a handful of the kind of big pieces of legislation uh, that, that we have tracked over the years. Um, and I think, you know, looking down there at the bottom, they're really looking at our, our carbon free energy sources and 100% of those by 2045 um, obviously will continue to drive the market. Um, the California Energy Commission, um, our, our state energy agency, um, is also making significant amount of investment into the state. Uh, these are just kind of on the technology side of things, but uh, those funds uh, find themselves into San Diego quite often. Um, you know, companies that we're working with, our entrepreneurs and even larger companies are, are taking advantage of the funding coming down from the state of California. You see San Diego, which is uh, home to uh, a pretty significant microgrid, has received significant amount of funding from the Energy Commission. Our military bases here um, are also getting money from the state of California to develop micro Microgrids on their own campus. So a lot of that funding is coming into the region. Um, and obviously the economic impact and the, the, the ability for those funds to not only support companies, but support job creation within those companies um, is significant. We've also got our local drivers here. Um, as you all know, I know this group has talked quite often about some of the climate action plans around the region. We've got 17 of the 18 cities in our region that are uh, have or are either in the process of adopting or, or working on a climate action plan. But those documents in, in, in of themselves are really market drivers here locally, especially as they re, uh, relate to uh, uh, EV infrastructure, EV deployment, 100% um, renewable energy through participation with San Diego Community Power. Um, but those those documents, um, while oftentimes they may just sit on a, a, a shelf, our cities are really using those to advance their, their climate goals and their energy goals. Uh, the Port of San Diego and the San Diego Airport uh, are no different. Uh, very aggressive agencies as it relates to climate and energy um, and are doing quite a bit to electrify uh, their own uh, kind of uh, footprint um, and at the same time re remove GHG uh, gases from or emissions from the air. Um, and also our private sector, you know, San Diego is not home to a ton of uh, headquarter companies, but we have our fair share uh, and we're definitely seeing CSR and ESG goals really helping to shape the way that private sector is looking at investments. And why is all this important? I think we all know this, heat waves, wildfires, our grid being constrained, um, climate inequities, I mean, California, the country, um, is just facing unpre unprecedented impacts of climate change. Um, and, and our hope is that, um, again, as the speakers talked about these, these job opportunities, what these kind of what these problems create in terms of opportunities, uh, I think we're really poised well to, to meet these, uh, these um, threats to our system. And, you know, one of the things that I think is important for, for everyone to know um, is that, you know, our, our power grid is constantly on the brink of shutdown, right? I mean, I think we all experienced, we all got that text on September 6th uh, asking us to reduce our, our energy usage so that the, the grid wouldn't go down. Um, and here in San Diego and other parts of the country, um, what kept those power uh, power on for all of us was energy storage and the fact that uh, we're generating a massive amount of sun during the day and we're storing that sun and that energy um, from that sun in storage and battery storage projects and we're able to use those those storage uh, that's uh, storage energy at later parts of the day uh, when the sun's not shining and energy storage is really um, probably one of the fastest growing sectors in kind of the clean energy space right now, just because of the need for this storage to, to really start to, to hang on to the renewable energy gen that we're generating during the day. Um, here in San Diego, a uh, significant amount of things happening in our own region that I hope that we're all proud of. Uh, we have the number two, uh, we are the number uh, home of the second largest uh, amount of solar installations in the country. Uh, LA uh, beats us uh, quite often. Sometimes we, we outpace them just because of size. Uh, but a significant amount of solar uh, generation happening in our region, uh, a lot on the residential side, obviously, but on commercial and some smaller scale 
um, as well. Um, as I said, energy storage is increasingly important in our region. Um, we are seeing more and more energy storage projects on the ground here. Uh, we're also hearing from community uh, concerns over kind of safety issues as they relate to energy storage. And, and I'll say, as these projects uh, go through the permitting process, they have to go through the fire marshal, they have to go through kind of the necessary, necessary safety um, protocols to ensure that they are safe. And so as these projects uh, start to become uh, more and more on the ground here in San Diego, uh, the technologies um, advancing rapidly, uh, but also the, the safety precautions that are being placed, put in place on these systems. So all these projects are in the San Diego region. All these projects are storing energy uh, when they're uh, when the uh, it's being generated during the day um, and really has a chance to make sure that as we face more threats of climate change, um, our grid remains remains stable. Uh, EVs, another big thing that's happening in our region, obviously a lot of adoption of EVs, uh, primarily uh, from the personal car perspective, but uh, that number actually is outdated, the 70,000 electric vehicles on the road. It's over right now over uh, 100,000, and so more and more electric vehicles on the ground here, especially as they become more affordable, and especially as gas prices continue to increase, uh, we're seeing more interest in the clean transportation space. Uh, this means opportunities for a workforce uh, you know, that had maybe traditionally been working on kind of internal combustion engine cars are now being retrained uh, to be uh, to be able to work on EVs. A uh, lot of opportunities in the installation of the charging infrastructure that's happening around the region. Uh, there's quite a bit of efforts uh, really being pulled together locally to make sure that we're attracting federal dollars down into our region uh, so that we can build more and more infrastructure in our region uh, to support uh, the electric vehicle uh, industry and just the amount of electric vehicles that we expect on the road uh, pretty soon. Uh, there's also some interesting technologies that uh, are, I would say, uh, the previous speaker noted, uh, just, you Hydrogen's not not new. Uh, it's being used all over the world. We're a little bit late to the game, I would say, in the U.S. Uh, but a number of different pilots are happening here in the hydrogen space, uh, in the transportation space, but also as it relates to energy storage. Uh, Borrego Springs Microgrid, which is owned and operated by sdg &E, has a number of different hydrogen uh, pilots in place there. Uh, the Palomar Energy Center as well uh, is really looking at hydrogen for electric generation and fleet fueling. So as green hydrogen becomes more and more uh, uh, of a thing, um, and then kind of the dirty hydrogen, the production of hydrogen becomes more and more clean, I think we'll start to see more and more hydrogen uh, deployment up and down the state of California. A uh, lot of activity happening right now in kind of the vehicle to grid space, making sure that as cars plug into the grid, there's two-way communication between the grid and the cars. Uh, oftentimes, these cars can be pulled together and almost act as a virtual power plant and pull that energy from the car uh, back into the grid. Uh, school districts are a great example of this, and Elko, or Cajon Valley School here uh, was one of the first uh, school districts in our, our county to really push out electric buses along with the B2G uh, vehicle to grid technology. Um, and so, you know, really looking at how buses, which sit idle for a good chunk of the day, uh, how they could be uh, potentially used uh, at different times of the day as a as basically a kind of battery on wheels. Um, and so as we see more and more funding coming in to electrify our school bus fleet, uh, there's going to be more and more opportunities to really look at buses in a whole different way. Um, and the technology's there, and we're starting to see more and more of those types of projects here in our region. As I noted earlier, one of the projects that uh, Cleantech San Diego is engaged in and, and, and leading, actually, is the Southern California Energy Innovation Network. And so this program is, is funded by the California Energy Commission. Uh, we actually serve four counties with our work, Imperial Riverside, San Bernardino, and San Diego. Uh, but really, the focus here is to make sure that we are supporting the next wave of energy entrepreneurs, uh, those companies that are oftentimes coming out of students and labs at the university. Um, you know, how can we work as a region to really help them get those technologies to market, help them find the funding to allow them to do that, uh, and help them find customers. Um, we uh, This, again, is our service territory, um, and we are supporting companies that are really, uh, again, tied to the grid uh, and will benefit the California ratepayers. Um, to date, we've worked with 68 companies. We've got 31 in our, uh, that are currently active in our program. Uh, out of that 68, I'll say that 80% of those companies are still in business. And from a startup perspective, that's th those are really good numbers. Uh, so the fact that, you know, uh, 
more than half, a lot more than half of those companies are still around is, is, is significant. So those companies are out, they're raising money. They've received almost 370 million in follow-on funding since entering our program. Uh, they are hiring. Uh, we do a report with them every quarter uh, to, to understand how much money they've raised, how many people they're hiring. Um, I, you know, and they also have patents and uh, fortunately for us and uh, for them are, are represented in, in their C-suite by a diverse uh, group of people. So these are small companies. They are quite often heavily engineering companies at this point, uh, but poised to grow in our region and again, uh, you know, looking to hire at some point. And so I think it's important that we we support these companies. Uh, you know, we never know if they're going to be the next Qualcomm or, you know, whoever it may be, but uh, it's important for us as a region to make sure that that we are serving these companies and making sure they get the, serve, uh, the, the resources they need. So that's a little bit about Cleantech San Diego. I hope it gives you a little bit of flavor, just kind of a what's happening here in San Diego. When we think about the future of the workforce here in our region, um, it's it's really all of the above. Um, you know, these companies, while they're very heavily technology focused, they need marketing people. They need all the different things that any sort of company needs. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot of opportunity here. And, and fortunately, we have SDSU and UCSD and UC, USD and our community colleges that are really, um, really doing, I think, a great job of making sure that we are training uh, the, the appropriate individuals to move into the space and our in the space and our obviously our labor unions, our electricians, all those types of uh, opportunities as well um, is very critical to the, the growth of this industry here. So we see this industry, again, not only changing and, and impacting in a positive way, our environment, but really helping to reshape San Diego's economy and really uh, reshape the way we do business here. So Linda, thanks again for having me. Uh, again, obviously happy to answer questions and I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, awesome. Close out your PowerPoint. Yes, ma'am. There we go. <laughs> well, we have a lot of questions. So I am going to start reading them right now. So from Devin, a question for Natalie, can you provide your contact info again, please? So um, Natalie, maybe you can um, write that in the chat. Yeah, I replied directly, but I'll put it. Um, oh, in got it. As well, okay. so everyone can see I see. It. I see yeah, the two replies. Yeah. Got it. You guys were looking at the chat when I was just totally engaged with all the presentations. All right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, a question for Jason from Laura. Are companies finding the people with the skills they need here in San Diego? Are there key skills that people should acquire to meet the needs of the clean tech companies? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say uh big answer is yes. Uh the companies that we're working with uh you know, are hiring locally. Um, obviously, they they hire from outside of San Diego because people want to move to San Diego. And so, you know, they'll, they'll hire people outside of San Diego. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for the most part, companies that we're talking to, whether those be some of our startups or even larger companies, uh, the skill set is here. Um, you know, thanks again to our universities, we churn out a lot of engineers here. And so that the, the, the pool of engineers in San Diego is quite, uh, quite large. Um, but I would say for the most part, we are we are making sure that um, you know, those that are educated here and want to go in this space, that there are opportunities for them and they have the skills that they need. But, you know, going back to Natalie's point earlier, I think, um, again, a, you know, a, a, maybe a clean tech or a climate tech energy company or a company is very focused on a particular technology, but they need the same set of skills that any company needs. Um, and so those 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 skills are really transferable, I think, from from any career to this this uh, this space. Uh, just because, you know, maybe not engineering, that's a little bit kind of nuanced to the, the energy side of things. But, you know, some of those broader skill jobs uh, are available in the energy space, just as they are, let's say, in the communications or life science or, or whatever it may be space. Thank you so much. All right. So for Professor Gabriel, we have a question from Peg. When did the, there are many questions. So I'm going to go, there's multiple questions here. Uh, Corey, so I am going to start with the first one, and I think you mentioned this. When did the climate policy master's program start? I think you were the first executive director. Is that correct? Actually, it started, uh, I got here in 2017, August. It, the, uh, that was the third cohort. So it started in 2015. Oh, my bad. Okay, good. Uh, how many students do you take each year? Uh, 
Well, this year we have 20, 22 students, or, but, but our ideal size is probably like 15 to 20. Okay. Okay. And then do most applicants come from undergrad studies or are most already in the workplace? Um, you know, it's, it's both. Right now, the unemployment rate is very low. So I think the ratio of people who are coming out of undergrad is a little higher than it usually is but um so it's it's a mix but I, I think ideally the program is targeted for people who have a little bit of work experience although it's not not strict requirement okay and then the last question for you Corey is that what are typical undergrad degrees of your applicants and I know it's why I had the opportunity and the pleasure to work with you for a little bit but they're all over the place right they're undergrad degrees yeah, I think the all over the place is the exact right word. Um, there are every year there's somebody with a degree that really surprises me, right? I mean, we do have the typical engineering and uh, 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 environmental science is pretty common, but you know, we've had people with theater degrees, with journalism degrees, et cetera. Right. Um, so there's no real, I'm trying to think of the most commonly occurring degree, I guess would be like, you know, this might sound weird, but it's like biology or ecology, actually, because not that many people major in like physics or like whatever the, the core science of climate is. Right, right. All right. Great. Great. And Caitlin uh, has a comment and a question. Um, insightful presentations. Yay for all of you. I added the yay for all of you. Um, a similar question is Laura's for the panelists and that for all of them is, you know, what are the key skills? Um, we know the overarching science on climate change is settled, although we're still working out nuances such as regional impacts. But in general, how important is it for a strong job candidate to know the nuances of the science? For example, knowing the, um, the latest IPCC report in and out versus having a good understanding of the action needed to make progress on addressing it. So that's a big question, but that's for all three of you. I would say that it's definitely the latter, especially from what I've seen. I don't think any company, especially if you're just going into like a tech company that's not super involved with policy or anything like that, they're not gonna expect you to know the ins and the outs of the IPCC report. Um, however, like I did touch on in my presentation, these companies do want you to like, show that passion and to show that connection to climate. So if you didn't know that the IPCC was, report was passed or anything along that lines, I think that would probably be detrimental to your application, but definitely think that it's more of a passion in learning as much as you can without having to know like all of the, the nuances of it. Awesome. Um, Corey and Jason, any comments? I mean, I I agree with that. It's it's definitely not. It, it it's about you know specific skills and specific areas. So we're amplifying people's skill sets with their capstone, et cetera. Not so much trying to um, make everybody or have everybody understand the nuances of the latest IPCC report. Because to be honest, um, I. Um, I don't re necessarily read the IPCC reports. I read the papers probably that go into the IPCC report, but climate change is real. It's bad, et cetera. We have a lot of policy inertia. Having a, a good, learning a good intuition about politics and policy and how things work and what emits and what solutions are actually practical is a lot more important than you know climate policy. Climate policy is like any other um, policy. It's a function of politics and humans and resources and economics. So as long as people get those broad principles, we're good. Awesome. Jason, any comments to add to that? I don't think so. I think, you know, for some of our companies that, again, are more kind of in the energy space and the climate world, you know, it's, it's I would say it's less on the climate policy side and maybe more uh, at least an understanding of kind of energy policy and the energy industry in general, right? I mean, I think the, it, it can be a little nuanced, as I was saying, but I think, you know, anyone that goes in this, you, you hope there's a passion there around climate, right, Natalie? I mean, that's why they're going towards this. And so I think that hopefully comes through with anyone, but you know, for, for the, kind of the technology on the energy technology side, I think there's some 
at least there needs to be some kind of basis of understanding of kind of the energy industry kind of in general. Okay, that's great. Well, those are our questions thus far. I have one more. Um, I'm going to share my screen one more time. And, um, and Linda, while you're sharing your screen, I'm going to drop just a link to a, a invite for a, a webinar that we're doing at Clean Tech San Diego, I think in May. Awesome. Um, awesome. But I think you, you talked about the Audubon and, and your relationship with the Audubon mm -hmm. Society. We're actually doing a, a event focused on kind of nature-based climate solutions. It's not really in our wheelhouse as an organization. Right. We know there's some great stuff happening around the region with Wild Coast and obviously Scripps and, and San Diego Audubon Society. So each of those three organizations will be kind of talking about some of the work that they're doing on that nature-based side of climate solutions. So uh, anyone on this call is welcome to just click that link in RSVP and join us on oh, uh, please. the second. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And um, just to say also, you know, things that I learned after I left my job at the city and started working for... Um, well, volunteering for uh, Stake for Grandkids and getting more engaged with the San Diego Audubon Society is that, you know, our wetlands sequester more carbon than forests do. And I just thought that was fascinating when I learned that a couple of years ago. It's really amazing, you know, how important our wetlands are and why it's so important to um, protect them. So, let me just do this last thing. This is for all of you who may not know how to, you know, uh, find out more about Stay Cool. You can visit our website at uh, www.staycool4, the number four grandkids. I can't actually see that, but I think that's it, .com. And then you can sign up to get um, our newsletter and action alerts, which we are happy to send out on behalf of a number of our um, other collaborating organizations as well. So we hope that you all enjoyed this presentation. I certainly did. I learned a lot. And I am very, very grateful again for our three speakers who took the time today, Natalie, Corey, and Jason. And I'm giving them all a huge round of applause. Yay to all of you. And I'm sure everyone who's muted is applauding also. So thank you again. It's 7.59 according to my clock and we are done. So everyone stay safe and stay cool for grandkids. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.